Hey guys, welcome back to Analog Snippets. In this video, we will discuss LDO with off-chip capacitor. LDO with off-chip capacitor is one of the oldest but still widely used LDO architecture. And there are good reasons for it. As LDO acts as the power supply for the other blocks, we want good amount of capacitor attached to it. Large capacitors help in providing sudden current demand and also stabilize the supply voltage. So essentially capacitors provide low impedance path at high frequencies. Another advantage of having a large capacitor at V out is that we are now practically independent of any on chip capacitor present on V out. And that means we can design LDO without worrying about what is connected at the output. Another big advantage of this architecture is their simplicity of design. As there is a big capacitor at the output, it naturally becomes the dominant pool. And that means we can keep amplifier architecture quite simple. Often only one stage amplifiers are used in these kinds of LDOs. Its job is just to keep the second pool far off. But this is where the design becomes tricky. Dominant pool depends not only on the C out, but also on the output resistance of the power transistor. And since the load current of LDO can vary by many orders of magnitude, this R out is not constant. And that means output pole of this LDO varies with the load current. And this changing dominant pole location causes problems with the stability, especially at the high currents. To explain this problem more clearly, let's take a design example. Let's assume that our load current varies from 100 microampere to 100 milliampere. That is, there is three orders of magnitude of difference between these two. Let's also assume that we have one microfarad of output capacitor available to us and the gate capacitor is 10 picofarad. From the value of I out, we can estimate the output resistance of power transistor. A simple equation of R out is 1 over lambda I out, where lambda is channel length modulation parameter. Let's assume its value to be 0 0.1. So we see that R out varies from 100 kilo ohms at the low load currents to 100 ohms at high load currents. As such, this R out will come in parallel with the series combination of R1 and R2, but let's assume that these R1 and R2 are too big to make any impact. Also, at low load current, the power transistor will be in sub threshold region, so this equation will not be strictly valid, but still it will have a very high output resistance. So, now from here we can calculate the output pole location. Here, for the numerical simplicity, I am using the angular frequencies. So we can see that output pole varies from 10 radian per second to 10 k radian per second. That is, there is three orders of magnitude of the movement. Now, since P out is our dominant pole, the low frequencies are actually the best case condition. So let's consider the worst case condition that is high frequency corner. Now from here, let's calculate the desired pole location of the second pole. Let's assume that we have a 60 dB of the loop gain. This loop gain is made of the amplifier gain and gain provided by the power stage. At maximum load current, the power stage gain will not be particularly high. So let's assume that power stage gain is 12 dB. So that leaves us with 48 dB of amplifier gain. For a good stability, we want the second pole to be at least at loop gain times the bandwidth, that is at gain bandwidth product. That means second pole needs to be at 10 mega radian per second or higher. Now from this value and the value of gate capacitor, we can calculate the required value of amplifier output resistance. So amplifier output resistance needs to be 10 kilo ohm or lower. Now this is not a particularly high value of output resistance that we usually associate with a high gain amplifier. But let's go on. Now with amplifier output resistance, and the amplifier gain, we can calculate the required GM. So to meet these specs, we need a GM of at least 25 millisiemens. Now assuming that this amplifier is designed at a high GM over ID ratio of 20, we can now finally calculate the required amplifier current. So in order to meet these specs, we need an amplifier with 1.25 milliampere current or higher. Now for a 100 milliampere LDO, this is a huge amount of current. And this example shows the problem with this kind of LDO topologies. In order to keep the second pole far off, amplifier needs a lot of current. So designing a low power LDO with these topologies is often difficult. 
Now, we may not be able to design a sub micro ampere amplifier for this LDO, but there are ways to reduce this current from 1.25 milliampere. So, next we will consider these techniques. In order to better appreciate the techniques, we will start with the open loop gain plot of this LDO. Before we do that, I wanted to emphasize that these numbers are only illustrative examples. These numbers will differ from design to design. For example, loop gain may actually be higher than 60 dB because the second stage gain may actually be higher than 12 dB. But any which way you do the calculation, you will end up with a high amplifier current. So here is the gain plot of our last example. Our objective here is to somehow reduce the frequency of the second pool so that we can reduce the current in the amplifier. So let's first talk about more obvious solutions. We can try to find ways to move the P out further in. Doing this will also reduce the requirement on the second pool frequency. Second obvious way is to keep the P out at the same location but reduce the required gain. Third way could be to create a zero which can cancel the second pool. And finally, we can find more economical ways of keeping the second pool at high frequencies. Obviously, we can combine these techniques to obtain a more optimized design. Okay, now let's look at ways to implement these techniques. So let's start with ways to reduce the dominant pole frequency. Now dominant pole frequency depends on R out and C out. So increasing either or both of them will reduce the dominant pole frequency. We can obviously ask for a bigger C out. So for example, if we have 10 microfarad capacitor, then design will be so much more easier. But bigger capacitor has its own problems. Vendor may not simply have an option to use any other value of capacitor. A bigger capacitor may also mean a bigger footprint. And bigger capacitor has low self resonance frequency. That means their usable frequency range is smaller. So if you have the option for a bigger capacitor, by all means get it. Okay, how about increasing R out? R out can be increased by increasing channel length of power transistor. But as power transistors are designed for a particular drive scent, increasing L means we also need to increase width of that transistor. That means for example, if we are doubling the length, we need to also double the width. So area becomes four times. This also means increasing the gate cap. So in that sense, it defeats the purpose. So increasing R out is almost never done in practical circuits. Our second technique is reducing the gain. Now reducing the loop gain will definitely improve the stability of the LDO, but it has its own disadvantages. A lower loop gain means poor load regulation and poor PSRR. So at first glance, it's not very desirable, but then there is a twist. Remember that amplifier stability is a concern only for the high load currents. So if we can selectively reduce gain only at high load current, which is the problem area and keep the high gain at low load current, then probably we can have an acceptable compromise. And this is what precisely is done in many LDO designs. One of the ways to do it is to connect a diode connected PMOS between V in and the gate node. How does it work? At low load current, power transistors gate is close to V in. So this diode connected PMOS is almost off. At higher load current, the gate of power transistor goes low and that starts to turn on this diode connected transistor. As diode connected transistor at the high current has low impedance, it basically kills the amplifier gain. In some design, there is a register connected in series with this diode connected PMOS to make the transition more linear. In any case, the sizing of this diode connected PMOS is a trial and error way, but it definitely works. Okay, let's now consider if we can keep the second pole far off using lower amplifier currents. Here we can again use the fact that LDO stability is a problem only at higher load currents. That means we need high amplifier current only at higher load current. So one way to go about this problem is using adaptive amplifier biasing. This basically means that we keep the amplifier current low at lower load current and we increase it as the load current increases. We can sense the load current easily by sensing the current into power transistor MP. Another commonly used approach is to insert a buffer between amplifier and the power PMOS. 
Actually, in this configuration, we are using a single amplifier to achieve both high gain and high bandwidth. And this may not be the most optimum solution. If we insert a buffer in between, then we can use amplifier just for the gain and buffer to achieve the high bandwidth. Another way to look at it is that by inserting a voltage buffer, amplifier is no more driving a large power device. It's only driving a comparatively smaller buffer. There are several ways to implement this buffer. We can use a source follower stage or we can use a common source stage with diode connected load. In fact, this later configuration has inherent adaptive current biasing because as the load current increases and this gate voltage goes down, current in this buffer stage also increases. As our last approach, let's consider the possibility of inserting a zero. One way to create zero is to place resistance in series with C out. And we are for some luck here. And that is because every off-chip capacitor inherently has some resistance associated with it called ESR. For example, a 100 milliohm ESR with one microfarad capacitor will give a zero at 10 mega radians per second. But here is the problem. ESR is not something that you can design for. And in general, we want to choose a capacitor with lower ESR. So ESR will improve the stability, but in some cases, it may not be sufficient. Another place to insert zero is in this feedback network. If we put a capacitor in parallel with R1, then it creates a zero with R1. So for example, if R1 is 100 kilo ohm, then a 1 picofarad CZ will also create a zero at 10 mega radians per second. But this zero will not be as effective as ESR zero because this also creates a pole. But pole frequency will be higher than zero frequency. So we still get some phase lead. So these are all the techniques that I wanted to discuss, which are commonly used to improve the stability of these kind of LDOs. In almost every design with external cap, you need to use at least one or possibly several of these methods. Okay, so once you have stabilized your LDO, there are few more things that you need to consider in these kinds of LDO architectures. Because of the presence of a big off-chip capacitor, these kind of LDOs must have some kind of overcurrent protection circuit. Secondly, this capacitor not only has ESR, but also ESL associated with it. So we will look at these two things in more details in next video. So post your comments below and thanks for watching.